Welcome to the loud and crazy history of quantum mechanics. Uh, it's so crazy that it got Einstein here sliding off his chair and Niels Bohr biting his fingers. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, I'd like to talk about, because I think it's important, science is important in society today, and also if you're interested in science, it's important to know how scientific discoveries are really made. And there are a lot of lessons that you can get from science, I think, that you can apply in your everyday life, and even some inspiration. Uh, for instance, science is more complicated than the myths portray. Newton did not uh, discover his physics by sitting uh, in a field and watching an apple fall. And Darwin did not discover evolution by looking at the beaks of the finches on the Galapagos Islands. In fact, he didn't even know enough ornithology to know they were finches. So that's all a myth. And the way it really happened is much richer, much more human, and much more complex. Also, uh, most pioneer geniuses experience failure after failure before their success. I find that inspirational, too, because in my life I've had many failures, too. And I know that if I keep going, hopefully I'll get some success, and you just have to hang in there. Uh, scientists are often confused about their theories right up until the moment they complete them, and even after they complete them. <laughs> and that, that's very important because of two reasons. One, it shows that these theories uh, have a lot more to say than uh, what meets the eye superficially, so that even their discoverers don't understand them, and it takes years to work out their implications. But also because it, it, it shows you that it takes new generations, people to have new ideas, to uh, new people coming into the field who aren't wedded to conventional beliefs and to old, old ideas. And I think you can apply that in your life too, rather than waiting for your children to improve your life after you're dead, uh, try and be open to new ideas while you're still alive and improve your own life. <laughs> and finally, because of these things, throughout science and also I think in business uh, and in, in all our lives, uh, psychologists have shown that um, Perseverance is the most important quality for success. So let's talk about the first step of quantum theory. Quantum theory is the physics behind almost every technology that makes modern world what it is today. Computers, uh, communications technology, cell phone, the internet. It's all based on quantum theory. And quantum theory itself was inspired, or the road to quantum theory was begun by a technology of its day, uh, the light bulb, which is why I'm showing Thomas Edison here. And when the light bulb was invented, scientists got interested in the properties of the light that's given off by things as they're heated. They wanted to make better light bulbs, and so they started studying how materials glow when they're heated, and this is some experimental data that shows uh, on this axis, it's a little fuzzy, but it's quantum theory, so it's okay to be fuzzy, it's uncertain. Um, it says wavelength there. And uh, so this is kind of the wavelength or the color of the light in visible range. And the vertical axis shows you how much is given off at every wavelength. So these are not theoretical curves. This is experimental measured data. And when physicists in the late 19th century tried to make physical models and apply Newton's laws and the, and the laws of uh, electromagnetic waves to, to figure out how this happens to derive these curves, they couldn't do it. They got the wrong answer. They got a totally absurd, ridiculous result. So nobody knew why materials behave like this. So that was a big puzzle at the end of the 19th century. Now, um, this guy, Max Planck, I like Max Planck because I have a complicated name, Leonard Mladenov. So when I make a reservation at a restaurant, I say I'm Max Planck. <laughs> <laughs> they don't usually spell it right, but at least they can say it. And they don't know who he is, so that just shows you what good fame in physics brings you, you know. Um, but Ma Ma Max Planck, uh, was not, did not set out to invent quantum theory, he set out to find evidence against the existence of atoms. So that also shows you how physicists, how much they know about what they're doing, okay? But he set out to find evidence against atoms. Uh, he thought he would, could do that by explaining this black body radiation without using atoms, thereby showing that atoms are, are worthless. And the reason is that in the 19th century, the idea of using unseen objects in your physics was very new. People thought that physics should describe stuff you can touch, feel, see. And so a lot of people, like Max Planck, were against the idea of using atoms. And so he tried to solve the black body radiation riddle without using atoms. And for these three years, he worked on it. These are actually from newspapers of the day that I cut out on Google. Uh, very nice fonts. Um, and, and he, uh, see, I'm as patient as he was. And, and he failed miserably. So he worked on that for three years and got nowhere. So at the end of that time, uh, he said, let me change my goals. This is also a good lesson. Let me let me be a little bit less ambitious. And rather than looking for the physics uh, behind these curves, rather than trying to explain where they come from using the laws of physics, let me just see if I can find a simple mathematical formula that will 
that will describe these curves. And he indeed did find that. That's right there, called Pl the Planck Law. And it doesn't matter if you know any math. It doesn't really matter what that says. But what, uh, what's important is that, that we call that a simple expression. You might not if you, <laughs> if you didn't like algebra in, in high school. But, but um, that, that, that simple expression, when you plug in numbers, gives you this curve, which is it's labeled quantum here. But it, this is the actual uh, experimental curve uh, that, the, that the experimentalists measured. So he found this uh, law. He had no idea where it came from. He just made up some mathematical formula that gives this curve. Meanwhile, physicists had this law. I mentioned it earlier. They applied Newton's laws, and they tried to derive the, the law. And they got this crazy result that's called classical here. That was done by a guy named Lord Riley and Sir James Jeans. And it doesn't work at all, but that's the law that the theory gives you, and that's the law that uh, this is the law that Planck says happened, but he didn't know where it came from. So we were in a funny situation where we had a theory that predicted something that was wrong, and we had a mathematical law that, 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 that showed that corresponded to data, but we had no idea where it came from. <laughs> so this is how physicists work. What can I say? So what happened next? Planck, to, to his everlasting credit, decided that he should be open-minded and forget about his uh, antipathy toward atoms and use atoms to derive the law. And he was almost successful, but he found he needed one little other really weird ingredient, and again, showing how open-minded and adventurous he was, okay? Uh, he, he, he realized from the mathematics that, that he could only derive the law if he constrained atoms to having only certain possible energies. So in life, many things come in continuous form, like water. You can fill up a glass to any level you want of water. But if you have jelly beans, you can only put them in one at a time. You could have one, two, three. You can't have 1.376 jelly beans. So physicists thought that most of the quantities of nature were continuous like the water. But now they realized, well, they didn't realize this, but, but Planck was saying that for atoms, it can only have certain, certain discrete levels of energy. And if I make that assumption, I can explain the black body radiation. So what was the reaction? Well, there was a whole spectrum of reaction to this. No one thought that this was a new law of nature and he had discovered, hey, Max, congratulations, you discovered quantum theory. The people who are most positive said, okay, you made this weird assumption, you derived the answer, there's something to what you're saying and we congratulate you because you can derive the answer and we'll eventually figure out what it means. And the other end of the spectrum said, this is all garbage. And um, in fact, Sir, Sir James Jeans was one of them. Uh, he's the one responsible for this law and he basically said, uh, uh, my law doesn't work and yours does, but I like mine better, which I think illustrates what Robert Frost said, why abandon a belief merely because it ceases to be true? <laughs> so, as you can see, physicists were not exactly clear about what's going on. So next along came Albert Einstein. For five years, not one single paper was written about Planck's quantum idea. And then this kid, well, a 20-something at the time, named Einstein comes along and he says, hey, Max, you didn't just explain black body radiation, but your quantum idea is a fundamental principle of nature. And in fact, you shouldn't just apply it to atoms, we should apply it to light as well. So, you know, we think of light as being like water that can have any amount of energy, or people used to think that because they thought it was a wave. And Einstein said, just like a water wave, it's, which is made of little atoms, your waves of light are made of these little particles called photons. And so the amount of energy in a light beam can only have certain discrete uh, values. Now, I get a lot of theories like this in, in my Gmail all the time. You know, people uh, say, hey, look at my theory. It's a beautiful theory. It's a crazy theory. You know, I don't know, things like the Earth is really a living organism. It's alive. It, it's Mars is its sister. Um, if you sit under a crystal, you'll cure cancer. I mean, you know, you're laughing, but, but this didn't look any more, more reasonable to physicists of the day than what I'm telling you now. But what Einstein did was go one step further, which is very important in science, and he applied it to explain something. And what he explained is called the photoelectric effect. It doesn't matter what that is. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll just tell you that that's when you, you shine light on certain metals, they give off electric, electrons or an electric current. And this is like black body radiation in that it could not be explained by using classical laws. Physicists had applied the laws of classical physics to this system, and they found that they got the wrong answer. Einstein, with his idea, of, of um, quantized light and photons was able to explain this. He, that's what he ended up getting the Nobel Prize for in, in the 19, uh, I think it was 1921. So this was a big deal that he could explain this, but the reaction of physicists was the same as it was to Planck. Good Einstein, I'm glad you could explain this, 
we don't believe this photon crap, we'll eventually figure out what it really is, but okay, it, it's something that explains this. So the best reaction was from Planck, who when he was recommending Einstein for the Nobel Prize said Einstein has done a lot of good things, so please excuse him for his stupid ideas like this photon. <laughs> now that's really interesting because, because Einstein was really saying that Planck's work was more important than people thought, but Planck was saying no it's not. <laughs> the next step came from um, Niels Bohr, the guy who was biting his nails up there. This was in 1912. Again, Bohr was a kid just out of uh, college. He liked Planck's theory, he liked Einstein's theory, and he said, let's combine them. Let's take the quantum uh, theory of light and the Planck's theory of atoms, and what happens if we put them together? And when he put them together, what he, he came up with, with was a model where the, where the atom, we can all, you may recognize this, we call the Bohr atom, where the atom has these discrete energy levels, and single photons can come in or be emitted and cause the electrons to jump around there. And using this model, he was able to explain what's called the um, spectroscopy of, of, um, of elements. So people had known for decades that certain elements give off certain discrete kinds of light when they're heated. Like if you take a penny and you put it in a fire, it glows green. It doesn't glow orange or yellow or a rainbow. It just glows green and it also gives off other frequencies you can't see. And why do, does each element have a characteristic uh, set of frequencies that it gives off? Bohr was able to numerically derive that using his theory. So no, again, great thing, no one cared, okay? So, so um, now they said, okay, Niels, you too have explained another ad hoc physical phenomena using these crazy ideas and eventually we'll figure it out and let's just move on. And it was another uh, 12 years, and, uh, whoops, I'm sorry, the reaction, well, th that's what I just told you. My favorite one was uh, Arthur Eddington who said quantum theory is a crazy German invention. Um, <laughs> oh, this guy too, he was a spectroscopist who, who um, it's really his work Bohr was explaining, his measurements, and he says it was regrettable that the literature should be contaminated by such wretched information, betraying so much ignorance. So that was the reaction. 1925 and 26, these guys came along. Um, that is um, Heisenberg, Werner Heisenberg. If you Google Heisenberg, you're gonna get Walter Heisenberg, okay? <laughs> As a physicist, again, I take offense at that, but uh, you can be a, you know, a star of a TV show for a couple years and you displace the founder of quantum theory from the first pages <laughs> of Google. But this is Werner Heisenberg, who Walter actually in, in the show named himself after but I um, got the first name wrong, but we can understand that because who knows physics anyway. So um, these guys came up with really the final step in the development of quantum theory. I mean, we've developed it further since, but this was the big step because they didn't just explain discrete phenomena using ad hoc assumptions. They came up, they each came up with a theory, a quantum theory that you could use to replace Newton's laws. So this is a physical theory that could, in principle, be applied to any system to tell you the quantum properties of that system. The problem was that uh, Heisenberg's theory was hard to understand and no one liked it because it had to do with things you couldn't observe. Schrodinger, in fact, read it and said it was disgusting and came up with his own theory, competing theory, which used waves, which is also strange because quantum theory is strange, but people liked it better because they were more familiar with waves and Heisenberg crazy matrices and things like that. Well, it was shown that the theories were actually equivalent. When they, it was shown that they were equivalent, um, Schrodinger reacted very badly. He said he wouldn't have even come up with this theory if he knew that it, that it would be equivalent to Heisenberg's theory. He was trying to, to refute Heisenberg's theory. But the interesting thing was, guess who showed that they were equivalent? It was Schrodinger himself. So, so he actually was trying to show that his theory was superior to Heisenberg's when he discovered that they were identical. But being a good scientist, he published that anyway and just groused about it. <laughs> um, Einstein, as you all know, didn't like uh, quantum theory at all because it turned out, even though he was one of the inventors, as it developed, it turned out that it has these probabilistic interpretations, so he didn't like it. And finally, um, what did Heisenberg say? Heisenberg said that Schrodinger's version is a bunch of crap. <laughs> okay, so this is how physics is really done. I wanted to make sure that I got that out. And, and it's a lot like life is really done. But in the, in the next decades, it's been about nine decades since then, quantum theory has become the most successful theory in the history of science. And as I said, modern life is really based on quantum theory. Just to show you how it's advanced, uh, this is a helium atom. It has a proton and two electrons, and that's an equation for it from the 1920s. And today, we, have, we know a lot more elementary particles than the proton and the electron, and this is what the equations look like. <laughs> 
And so these are the equations for what's called the standard model that, you know, the Higgs boson is part of that that we just discovered. And things have gotten a lot more complicated and a lot more advanced in the last decades. And our laboratories have too. They've gone from tabletop, simple tabletop systems to stuff like this, which is the Large Hadron Collider in, um, in Geneva in Switzerland. So if you want to know more, you can look at my book, The Upright Thinkers, which talks about the human journey from when we were apes to now when we understand the cosmos. And I try to, to emphasize the social and cultural connections uh, between science and human life in general. And that's it. Thank you very much.